Welcome to Curiously Caitlin, a podcast where we try to make theology make sense. I'm Caitlin Chess, and every week on this show, you will hear a kid question about God, theology, or the Bible, and then I'll talk with a scholar who will try to answer it. Thank you so much to everyone who followed and listened to the show last week. I'm so thankful to know so many people want to learn more about theology, including learning from little kids and scholars. Many of you have asked if there's a way for your kids, or other kids you love, to leave a question for us to answer. And there is. You can go to holypost.com slash curiously and leave us a voice message with your question. That's holypost.com slash curiously. I'm so excited to hear what you are curious about. And now, on to this week's question. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Dr. Krista McCurlin, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Caitlin. This is Dr. Krista McCurlin. She is lecturer in systematic theology at Cary Baptist College in Auckland, New Zealand. She's also the founder and executive director of Logia International, which seeks to support women in theology and biblical studies for the sake of the academy and the church. She is the author of God's Provision, Humanity's Need, The Gift of Our Dependence. All right, let's hear our question for today. Why do humans not have superpowers? Because I want to fly. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yes, it's such a good question. And I love the honesty of, I'm asking because I would like to fly. I have a particular superpower I would like to have. <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, so let's start out with, well, first of all, what's your initial reaction? Why don't humans have superpowers? Oh, I think it's such a good question. Um, <laughs> so uh, you may or may not know, but my work has been especially on human persons and our needs. So actually yeah. thinking about how we are creatures of need. And I think we were meant to be creatures of need in a context of God's great abundance and goodness where we had no inhibitors to receiving the true need satisfier uh, to get that need met fully. But with the entrance of sin into the world, unfortunately, um, we are now creatures of need. Same thing. That's a good thing. But we are creatures of need in a context of scarcity and lack where there's mm. actually it's harder to be in relationship with God. It's harder to be in relationship with other people and with creation. Um, so when I when I think about why don't we have superpowers, it's such a good question. And I do at some point want to talk about, I actually do think we have some superpowers if oh, we okay. think about what who humans are in light yeah. of God's desires for the world and our role within creation. So I actually do want to circle back to more of a positive take on that. But okay. the superpowers we don't have, yeah. <laughs> like laser vision and x-ray vision or flying or um, being able to be super strong, I think a lot of it is because we we need to feel our need. So if I was Superwoman right now, um, you know, and and I, I could I could fly and and I couldn't be hurt by anything, and I had laser eyes and X-ray vision. I wonder how aware I would be of my actual need for God or for other humans, like um, that language of self-sufficiency. So yeah. it's all about me and what what I can provide for myself. But what I love about being human and that we're not the creator, so we think of God as the creator and we're the creature, like a lot of other creatures, we need rest, we need water, we need food. And I think humans also have a special kind of need for a relationship with God, and they are meant to live out of that need in a particular way. So I just wonder... Because even now, without superpowers, I think we can lack awareness of yeah. our need for God and for others and to be in relationship, good relationship with the creation. So if we had superpowers, I think we'd be even less aware and less sensitive to our need for dependence, for weakness, for vulnerability, the things that I actually think are some of the most beautiful aspects of being human. Yeah. Oh, I so appreciate that because I do. It's it's a funny question. On one hand, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember being a kid and, and watching superhero movies and thinking, oh, it'd be so great to have the superpower. But on the other hand, this is a question that 
even if I don't use the language of superpower, I, I think about this all the time of things that I wish I had that would make me, as you just said, more self-sufficient, less dependent mm. on other people. I've even heard Andy Crouch talk about, you know, technology and wealth and the ways in which I don't need someone to take me to the airport because I have Uber or I don't need someone to help me cook dinner because I can pay a service to bring me dinner. Or so we create conditions under which we we have less need of other people. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about why that matters theologically? Because I think some mm-hmm. people, they have an innate sense that maybe trying to overcome our sense of human dependence might not be great. Even the examples I just gave, you could see ways in which trying to overcome that dependence means I don't have community, means that maybe mm-hmm. I'm not living the same kind of, of life that would be really beautiful. We might have a romantic idea, right, of a former agrarian life that would have been very nice. Mm-hmm. But why does it matter theologically that we both are dependent creatures and the word that you use that's just so important that we have needs and that those needs, there are needs that are specific to being human. Why is that important theologically? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most important thing is the creator creature distinction. So God has no need. God is completely self-sufficient. We have a fancy theological word called aseity. Don't miss the big word Dr. McCurland uses here, aseity. It means that God exists of and from himself, not from anywhere else. God does not need like we need, but also, and this is very important theologically, God is not created. He doesn't come from anywhere else. If you think about this too much, it will make your brain hurt. (laughs) Where Mm. God has no needs. God is within God's self, uh, the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, They are flourishing. They love each other. They literally are love. And even that idea of love, right? You need to have someone to both give and receive that love. And that's why throughout the great traditions of Christian thinking, we talked about God as love, but we need threeness in God or more than oneness. And there's lots of debates on why we stopped at three. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> We're going to have a lot more to say on this show about the Trinity, but this is important. Dr. McCurlin is showing us why the doctrine of the Trinity matters. It's not merely an academic exercise that theologians came up with to have something complicated to think about. But the, the minimally to say that we actually need Uh, a giver and a receiver. And so often we talk about the father gives love, the son receives love, the spirit is the bond of love between them as they love one another for all eternity. And that's the cool thing, Caitlin, is like, we can sometimes think that God, maybe, maybe God was just like, uh, bored, you know, or, or really wanted something to, to do its chores or, (laughs) I don't know why we often think of of why there's something rather than nothing. We'll come back to this question in another episode, because lots of people, including lots of kids, have asked, why did God make anything at all? But throughout the great traditions, we've often talked about how, well, there's something because God just was so good, that abundance, God wanted to share the abundance of the divine life, the flourishing of those three persons with something that was other to God's self. And so it's an overflow of God's goodness that we then have creation and we have the creation as, as we have it. It could have been otherwise, right? Like we could have been creatures that didn't need, uh, air to breathe or food Mm. to eat, or we didn't need sleep. Like God could have conceivably have made us quite self-sufficient. Also, human persons could have been asexual in how we reproduce, Mm. right? Like we don't, we didn't, it didn't have to be this way, but for some reason, and I think it's because of the goodness of God, that God calls the creation good. And then what's that crazy bit, right? Like Sabbath, we're just talking with our kids this past (laughs) Sunday, right? I asked them, I said, so, so today's Sunday. And we often talk about that as Sabbath, which is where we rest. And I said, do you know why we do that? And Rhea, my my eight-year-old goes, well, because God rested. Mm. I said, well, that's exactly right. I didn't even know you knew that. But but can you tell me, why do you think God rested? And and she thought for a second and she goes, well, he, he must have been tired. <laughs> I said, well, that's what's so crazy is like God wasn't tired. 
God want, God was satisfied with the goodness of this work and then invites all of creation into God's rest. This beautiful picture of God inviting us into what God didn't need. Yeah. Uh, we might call that divine pedagogy, God teaching us something mm. that is an invitation to the flourishing life. And so this idea, first of all, that God doesn't need creation. God wants creation. God wanted the world as it is and wants you and wants me and wants to be in relationship with this beautiful child that asked this question yeah. and gave us these markers. I think Tom Wright talks about these as kind of these signposts in our current state of being that point to who we are meant to be. And now those are broken signposts. So we've mm. got to do a little bit more work to kind of recover what that need and even our desires are pointing to. But initially, I would see before there was sin, before we tried to be self-sufficient and, and apart from God, it was just this beautiful relation where, where we wanted, God wanted us to flourish in relationship with God, with one another and creation. So I actually think it's wrapped up in the whole story yeah, yeah. about how we are who we are and how God is who God is. It's a major way we would distinguish between our, our ways of being. This episode is sponsored by Brazos Press. Brazos Press publishes books that creatively draw upon the riches of the Christian story to deepen our understanding of God's world and inspire faithful reflection and engagement. They also happen to be the publishing partner for two Holy Post hosts, Sky Jadhani and myself. What I love about Brazos is that they publish books across a wide range of Christian perspectives. Rather than digging in on one viewpoint, they aim to further conversations and inspire wonder. The authors who work with Brazos are scholars, thinkers, artists, and activists who bring expertise and practicality to the books they write. Right now, Curiously Caitlin listeners can get 30% off all Brazos books, including Mine and Sky's books, as well as other recent Holy Post guests, including Matthew Bates, Mike Cosper, Nijay Gupta, Scott McKnight, M. Daniel Carroll, Jessica Hooten Wilson, John Ward, and Karen Swallow Pryor. Visit www.bakerbookhouse.com slash the Holy Post to get 30% off your next book from Brazos Press. That's www.bakerbookhouse.com slash the Holy Post to get 30% off your next book from Brazos Press. And thank you to Brazos Press for sponsoring this episode. Yeah. And how does this relate? I've heard you talk before about the image of God and how we think about what that means mm. to be made in the image of God. And it seems like sometimes mm. we uh, we throw this phrase around a lot. I mean, we sometimes use it in a positive way to say, oh, because people are made in the image of God, that really that means they're valuable and important. But we don't often pause and say, OK, what <laughs> what do we mean when we use that term? Mm. But sometimes I've heard people use it almost in a way of, you know, human creatures are described in in this creation account in Genesis as different than other creatures. And almost in a way of because they are different than other creatures, they might have less need or they might be more self-sufficient or because mm. they are made in the image mm. of God, they're closer to God in the sense of of as you've just described God God not needing anything, God having mm. everything that God needs. How do we think about that? that really important theological language that humans are made in the image mm -hmm. of God in a way that helps us understand what you're also saying about need as something that is central to what it means to be human. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so it's this really, I think it's a tightrope that we're watching with that We're walking when we come to the Genesis account. On the one hand, we are the only creature called, uh, you know, or that, that God says is made in our image, um, according to our likeness, it's only creature that's like that. And only creature that's also given a particular vocation of, of ruling the world. Now, again, how do we mean ruling? Mm -hmm. We're reading that often as people who are on, a, on east of Eden, right? We're yeah. after a sinful context. And so it's very hard for us to conceive of rulership that is not power over, but is instead giving power to. Yeah. And I think that's actually what we see going on in that Genesis text is God gives, actually gives power to humans and humans are meant to use that power to care for the creation and to care for each other. So there is this 
specialness, if you will, and that's some of the superpower that I'd want to say that I actually mm. do think we have as human persons. We are literally meant to represent the creator, the God of the universe in the created world. We are meant to extend God's peace-giving, life-giving, flourishing presence in the world around us. And that is unique to what humans are called to. And at the same time, we are also a creature. Mm -hmm. We are what we talk about having that nefesh, this breath of life. It's the same breath that's given in chapter six to the the rest of the creaturely kind. We're made out of earth um, and these other creatures, they they proceed from the earth. The earth actually brings them forth, which is a whole other unique thing (laughs) where it's not just humans that are bringing things forth that are, that are, um, given a, a, a vocation, actually the earth is told to do something and it does something. The, the moon and the sun, they are told to govern the night and the day. And so we've got to be really careful, especially in the history of interpretation where we have been, it's what's called anthropocentric, human centered, mm. where we can read those texts and make it all about humans being the center of the world. No, we aren't. God is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I think these texts are at pains to communicate is God is creator. We are not. God shares power and agency with the created order. Within that created order, humankind is given a unique kind of agency to steward God's divine presence in the world. But the rest of creation is also given vocation according to its own nature to press into. Mm. So we want to dignify both the rest of the creation because if we're going to talk about what are we most like, it's going to be the the other created things. That likeness language that we're talking about with God, we've often overread what that likeness is. And then what we tend to do is we take whatever attribute or whatever quality (laughs) we think is most important in that period of human history, and we we say that's what the likeness must be. Dr. McCurlin is about to explain how Christians have come up with so many different ideas about what the image of God means. At times, we thought rationality was the image of God in humans, or that relationality is what made us made in the image of God. So we say how humans must be like God and not like the animals. But... The more we've looked at the different features that have been given, like reason or relationality, sociality, those features actually we're finding in many, many cases within the animal kingdom. And also, it's hard to know exactly what what is that attribute that's we're bringing in. It's called eisegesis, where we bring in our interpretation on the text yeah. and we fill out content that, according to a lot of biblical scholars, the the Genesis account is underdetermined when it comes to what the image of God actually is. Eisegesis is a word that's thrown around these days, so it's important to add a little bit to Dr. McCurlin's definition. Eisegesis, in the most helpful sense, means reading into the text ideas we already had, importing in an interpretation without listening for where the text might surprise or discomfort us, deciding ahead of time what the Bible will say. Bringing good theology to the text with us is not eisegesis. Bringing our own experience to the text with us is not necessarily eisegesis. We all bring things with us to the text when we read, and we cannot avoid having biases and prejudices impact our interpretation— But we can listen carefully to the witness of the church throughout history and around the world to help us see what we wrongfully bring to the text. Ideas like the ones Dr. McCurlin is talking about, ideas about what it means to be human that are very different from the way God describes humans in scripture. So at the risk of this being a very unsatisfying answer about what is the image (laughs) of God to your initial point, Uh (laughs) what we can say is we are made in the image of God. Those are both relational terms. God is the one who has given us that image. Later, whatever the content of that image is, we know it is the immediate consequent or the the outworking of that image is to have this vocation of caring for creation, the world, and and honor to God. But when we turn to chapter 5, we see that same image and likeness language used about how Adam has Seth. Adam and Eve have Mm. Seth, and that he is in their image and likeness. So from that language, we can also kind of reason backward Again, strengthening that relational understanding Mm. that just how the man and the woman are having offspring that's part of their kind. So humans have been really called part of the kind of human. 
or of the, sorry, part of the kind of God, which is different from the rest of the creatures. So the mm-hmm. other creatures, they are created according to their kinds. We don't get that repetition for human beings. So it begs the question for the reader, well, then who's the kind of yeah. humans? Well, Catherine McDowell would say, well, the kind is God. Catherine McDowell is an Old Testament scholar at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and the author of the image of God in the Garden of Eden. We are in God's family in some way, Mm. but at the same time being really careful to say we aren't God either. So while we might be in God's family, God (laughs) is still distinctly other to the human person and to creation. And part of that is then living out that vocation. And then, of course, I'm a theologian, so that means we get to zoom out as well and look across the canon. And what's beautiful is how we see Paul, especially, kind of filling out that content that was quite underdetermined. There was enough content for people to understand what it meant in terms of being an image of the divine, but also not being divine. They had enough content to say that. But then Jesus in the New Testament is literally called the image of God. Mm -hmm. And if we want to talk about superpowers for just a second, I think we can... We can think about Jesus as, oh, well, he has these superpowers because he's God. (laughs) Actually... I think, and this I know this is a bit controversial, but I think his superpower is he lives wholeheartedly into his need for a mm. relationship with his dad. Like, I think what we see in Jesus, it's the first human being who ever has, and probably ever will because of sin, actually believed that he was beloved. Mm. So we see his genesis in his baptism, right? Like, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately from that statement, that public declaration of Jesus's identity of the beloved son, then he goes into the desert and is tempted. And those temptations are all about his self-understanding. If Mm. you're really the son of God, dot, dot, dot. And so what what I think we see in Jesus is one who he, he just, he loves his dad so much and he relies on the spirit that is on him in fullness without measure in a way that shows us what a, a truly wholehearted, flourishing human mm. being can look like, not because they're God, though he is, fully affirm that, mm-hmm. but because he's truly human and he is showing us what does a human person who lives in utter dependence upon God look like. And I think that's his superpower. He shows us, and yeah. Paul riffs on this, right? Like, well, then we get strength and weakness. We get power through weakness. It doesn't mean non-power. It actually means it's it's turned on its head. I mean, it's the upside down kingdom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what we see. Yeah. So that's, I think, it's the superpower that that we do have. Um, so anyway, sorry, that was a I long answer that. to your no, question. No, that was so great. That was so great, partially because I think, To remind people what you were just saying before you got into the Jesus part, one of the challenges for us in figuring out what image of God language means is that even when we try not to, we are bringing our assumptions about what humans are when we read a story like Genesis. Mm -hmm. So if we live in a time and place in which the quintessential human is the rational Western man, (laughs) then we're going to read Genesis and be like, oh, there it is. There's a picture of this idea that I have of what a really good human is. Or we talked to Daniel Hill earlier and his idea was like six, three perfect hair. Like we have this idea of what a perfect human is. (laughs) And then we read it into these stories, which is why we need Mm. Jesus. Like if we don't have this example of, okay, what is a really fully human life? We are easily tempted to say it's what I already thought a good life was or mm-hmm. a valuable human looked like. Bringing it into the, the Jesus part, I wouldn't be surprised if we told this child, you know, your all of your answers. And then she said, OK, <laughs> sure, maybe. But what about in eternity? What about in the new heavens, mm. the new earth, when there isn't sin, is is part of the effect of sin that I can't fly (laughs) is part of the effect of sin Mm. that I don't have these features these superpowers that I would like to have and maybe I might imagine I mean I remember as a kid thinking especially reading like the story Mm. of Jesus walking through walls going okay well maybe in eternity I will be freed in some sense from the limitations Mm. of my body and however I imagine those to be Um, What would you say to the kid who was like Mm. okay maybe now we don't fly but could we maybe later (laughs) Yeah. Well, I like this kid. Um, 
No, I think oh, so. Right, this is going to be in the realm of speculation, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna anchor it in a few kind of I think theological data points that when then we can speculate out from. So first, we're gonna look at Jesus's resurrection body. It actually seems to have some interesting features, <laughs> right? Like the disciples are in a locked room and he ent- he appears is what it says in, in the gospels. So how does he appear? And Carmen Imes, I appreciate, she says something about like, maybe it's actually that Jesus's body is so much more solid than those walls. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that there's something changing now that, that there's now even more substance. But with Jesus's resurrection body, it's kind of this touch point for us. Now, interestingly, when we say that, maybe your, your friend might not be as thrilled to know. Well, remember, Jesus still has wounds. Yeah. Right? So Thomas sticks his hand in Jesus's side. That's a that's a pretty big wound. So it raises questions, I think, back to your point about how when we think of the ideal human person, we can often be quite ableist, racist, and sexist yeah. in how we think about the ideal human person. And so what I think is quite beautiful, and Maya Whitaker has done beautiful work on this as well, is we actually get both the wounded Jesus with these crazy supernatural properties, it seems, <laughs> to do different things. Dr. Maya Whitaker is lecturer in practical theology at Laidlaw College and author of Perfect in Weakness, Disability and Human Flourishing in the New Creation. But also remember, he eats. Remember, he eats with them. Like he, well, one, he cooks. I love that he cooks. And then he <laughs> eats with his disciples. So I think that's the other theological toehold I'd want to have as we think yeah. forward is it is God called creation good. And once the, the humans were formed, it was called very good. And because God is good and the ground of all goodness, I don't think that then gets undone. So I would want to go back to that language of we are creatures of need. We were in a context of abundance. Now we're in a context of scarcity. But again, we will be in a context of a of abundance. And now also with transformed bodies. I don't think the man and the woman actually had the kind of uh, physical constitution of this resurrected body prior yeah. to Jesus. I actually think that that was one of the things, this progression. And sometimes I think we need to be careful how we can think about going back to Eden. I actually think we need to think forward from that, right? Because you think Eden is a garden. It's a, I think it's a temple-like garden. But in Revelation, when we get to the, to the garden image again, there's a city. Yeah. And there's not just the one language of the man and the woman. There's, um, there's multiple languages. You know, there's human cultures are, are celebrated yeah. in all their goodness as the, the, the bad of those human cultures have been eradicated. And so there's a progression if you compare the gardens, as we can think about perfection as this static state And often we don't think about how our finitude and our need is good. And actually we would have kept developing Adam and Eve. However, we understand that story, they would have kept growing and maturing. But we often think of perfect as nothing can change. Yeah. Well, no, change is not a bad thing. And in fact, I think in the eschaton, I'm going to, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn more about you, yeah, Caitlin, yeah. like we're going to grow in our relationship. I'm going to grow in my relationship with Jesus. I'm going to grow yeah. in my relationship with the father and spirit. However, all that's going to work out. Dr. McCurland uses this word a few times, eschaton. This is the technical theological term for the end, for the consummation of history, for eternity, for the new heavens and new earth, how the story ends. You might've also heard the word eschatology before, the study of the end. But we're going to continue to grow. It, yeah. And so we, we will be creatures of need, but now in the context of abundance with no inhibition and now these transformed bodies, which to your child's question mm-hmm. <laughs> might mean we fly. <laughs> it might. It might mean we fly. But I think the main, it's the grounding criterion of what doesn't undermine human need and creatureliness. Yeah. If flying would somehow affect our ability to rely on the presence of the lamb i don't think we're gonna fly yeah yeah but but why not you know i just i think it's unfathomable how it's going to be but i do think we have some of these grounding criteria about what is actually good in being a creature and then being a human creature in particular that i think can inform how we think about the next life 
Yeah. Oh, that's such a good answer. I love I love the imagination of it, of like, oh, I'm not going to squash your question and be like, absolutely not. But it's a question of, well, there's things we don't know yet about what it really mm-hmm. will look like to both be have our bodies restored and and redeemed and our our faculties restored and redeemed but also like our relationships and our community we don't know what that looks like exactly but we have some good indications to help us think creatively about it so thank you krista for that last question imagine that the sweet girl who asked me this question i got to be face to face with her imagine you are face to face with her and she asks the initial question that she asked why don't humans have superpowers? I would like to fly. What is your shortest, succinct answer that you would give her? Maybe. God wanted birds to glory in their flight. And it's great that birds get to do that and they do it to the praise and glory of me. Humans, you get to to give glory to me in other ways, especially loving me and loving your neighbor. Mm. and loving that bird that flies Mm -hmm. (laughs) so let's let the bird fly and maybe one day you will too and the birds (laughs) will show you how to do that in Mm. in the eschaton but for now i have given you superpowers i want you to live into and i've empowered you to live into them so that might be the best way i would go i love that (laughs) <laughs> I love that. I think that's great. And it's a good way too to introduce um, God cares about all creatures and all creatures have different ways of glorifying mm-hmm. God. Um, so thank you, Krista, for your wisdom and for taking this important question really seriously. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I love the way Dr. McCurlin answered this question because she modeled so well what it looks like to be genuinely curious. That's what theology is, asking questions about who God is, what kind of creatures humans are, what kind of world God made, and what we're supposed to do in it. We have resources for answering those questions in the Bible, as well as through other ways of knowing things like science and history and art, but we don't come up with good answers until we ask questions. Today's question could sound like the quintessential kid question that grownups in Sunday school laugh and shake their heads at, but look how it opened up so many important theological ideas. This is how the church has always done theology. In response to new questions, addressing new problems, trying to figure out how to hold in tension two things we know are true, but don't understand how they work together. Jesus said we are supposed to have faith like a child. And many of us were taught that that meant accepting everything without question. But anyone who's spent any time around children knows that that's ridiculous because kids ask all kinds of questions. I think part of what Jesus meant by faith like a child was a questioning faith, a faith free to be curious because we know that any question we ask will only lead us back to the good and merciful God who is always telling us a better story than we could dare to hope for. Curiously Caitlin is a production of Holy Post Media, produced by Mike Stralo, editing by Seth Gorvett, theme song by Phil Vischer. Be sure to follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary, plus cute kids, and never any butt news. 